known John a long time. I've, I've known John for about, uh, oh, 20 years now. And uh, our acquaintanceship goes back to just before the ACF days when uh, he was still at Yorktown with Jack Bertram and uh, what was then a relatively small machine design group just prior to the start of the ACF project, uh, which took everybody out to uh, Sunnyvale, California. Why Sunnyvale? Uh, that, well, the project was initially in uh, a uh, kind of warehouse in uh, Sunnyvale, and then uh, a year or two later moved to a uh, laboratory, a more stately laboratory on Sand Hill Road. When did you first meet John? Uh, I met John uh, at, uh, at Yorktown. Somehow they, I had written a paper, must have been uh, 19, the, the paper appeared in 67, so this must have been around 1966, uh, on parallel computing, which they had somehow noticed and uh, contacted me, and I met him at that time. He, I believe he and Jack Bertram visited at uh, New York University. After the visit, I came up to Yorktown. I spent a summer at Yorktown uh, learning something about mach how machine architecture was actually done, getting familiar with the basic issues, and then continued as a consultant um, at, uh, in the California days of the project. But were you young to the project? Uh, well, yes. I, I had just uh, become aware of it. The project was just starting up. I was new to computer science and uh, and uh, becoming aware of issues both on the hardware and the software side. So uh, I was, you know, I learned a lot from John. He was far more experienced and had thought much more than I had about all of these issues. And uh, I, uh, uh, I functioned for a while as a kind of glorified technical secretary to him almost. Uh, he, he never has liked writing. He's, he's never really written much. Uh, so he depends a lot on people who, uh, so to speak, write for him. How experienced was John when you met him? And did he have a reputation? Well, uh, he was very conspicuous in the project. You know, it was it was clear that he was regarded as the principal thinker by uh, by uh, Jack Bertram, who was the uh, manager of the project, uh, and he, rel he relied on John to set the key technical directions both in hardware and software. Uh, the thing that interested John in the hardware area and has continued to is uh, overlapped architectures in which one can issue many instructions at the same time. And uh, on the software side, he's been very interested and is still interested in uh, global techniques for the optimization of uh, programs. So it's fast architectures, uh, to some extent special purpose architectures, but more uh, general purpose architectures, and also uh, software uh, to make them run as they should run. Uh, he, he's been a key developer of the uh, whole modern technology of optimization, and uh, I, uh, those were already uh, known to him and, uh, and reasonably clear to him in a fairly developed form in 1967 when, when we first met. Uh, his scientific style is one in which he keeps circling back uh, to the same question. And like, uh, I think of it sometimes like a dog worrying a bone. You know, He'll chew away at it for a while and then forget about it for a while, but then always come back to the same bone and chew on it some more. And, uh, and uh, gradually then uh, the technical difficulties get solved. So he's, he's a, a great one for uh, favorite themes scientifically. The, uh, well, uh, you know, one of his favorite themes has always been optimization, especially optimization at the uh, Fortran level. And he's found, he's found uh, over the course of the years better and better, deeper and deeper ways of of doing that really right. Um, he's certainly been interested in machine architectures and in adapting uh, things that go all the way back to the stretch architecture to new technologies. 
and he's been interested in a very fast special purpose hardware uh, like the Yorktown uh, simulation engine and devices of that sort that uh, attain extreme speed in certain uh, directions. Well, he was, he was, you know, very senior with, and well recognized within the project. That was a major project, which went up to about 200 people uh, at its peak, maybe even more. So it was a, uh, you know, the, it was a big project, even in IBM terms, uh, with a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, recognition uh, within the uh, corporation, though it never made it to a product. It was killed. Uh, uh, but when, when far along in the whole development, uh, and he was the chief architect of that uh, whole uh, project, so it was, that was a very senior thing. I, I didn't really know his, uh, his earlier history. You know, when I met him, he was a, a senior researcher here at the laboratory. Um, the other uh, key personality in that whole development was uh, Jack Bertram, who was an exceptionally brilliant uh, manager destined uh, to rise very high in the corporation, uh, and who did until his untimely death uh, a few years ago. Well, the, uh, you know, that was a very advanced machine for its time and, and would have attained, uh, I think it would have had a big impact if it had appeared. It would have attained very high performance uh, for, the, uh, for the day. It was pioneering the uh, what became the ECL technology. Uh, it was talking about uh, performance levels that only were really reached uh, maybe 10 years later. Uh, so, uh, you know, in that sense, it was interesting, but, uh, or, you know, exciting as hardware is what I mean to say. But, but, uh, the software side of John's work has been very consistent, you know, and, and uh, aside from sort of uh, technical progress, uh, the circle of questions and the circle of ideas that one is discussing uh, is really, you know, tends to be the same almost from decade to decade. He's, you know, his interests are very persistent. And uh, that, I think that's part of his strength, that he keeps coming back he loves the questions, and he keeps coming back to them over and over again, and pushing them forward from all sorts of different angles. What would you say these questions are? Really well, it's the ones that I've mentioned. It's, it's uh, on the software side, it's particularly compiler optimization. He's always also been very interested in, in speech and in the, uh, the recon. Uh, speech and language as uh, situations in which uh, you could uh, explore various questions about the, the disambiguation of ambiguous uh, of ambiguous information, largely by statistical techniques. So he's returned. To, that was already a question he was interested in in 1967. It's one that he's pursued through the whole Yorktown uh, speech development and through some of his continuing work on the statistical disambiguation of uh, written text. Uh, he's one who, uh, it's part of his style to decide that certain ideas are big and important and to concentrate on them for years and decades, really. So his, his scientific career and the whole period that I've known it has had a very consistent flavor. And, and that also operates on the other side, the things that didn't interest him in 1967 are, with high probability, still don't interest him in 1990. Uh, the, um, and something I can remark about him in a personal sense is that he's a very, like many uh, scientists, especially like many fine scientists, he's a very boyish personality. He's, I, uh, I always tend to think of people as, as in terms of their psychological age. And uh, John, I, John, I would put it around nine years old, maybe 10 or something like that. He's still, he's still very much the, uh, the boy who loves science and has certain favorite questions. It's, uh, for him, it's very much of a hobby. And, um, 
he, uh, you know, it's a hobby. He's aware of the importance and and aware of the impact of advanced technology. Another part of his strength is that he's always followed the technologies very closely and uh, had a very exceptionally keen sense for where the technologies were going and uh, that has helped him to bring his machines into architectural balance. Uh, they've always made uh, effective use, his designs have always made effective use of the technologies. Um, but uh, they're, they're just questions he enjoys and, and you know, he, he lives them and, he, and he's always uh, talking about them and he's apt to call you up at 11 at night with, a, with a, you know, some idea that he's just gotten enthusiastic about and needs to discuss with somebody. What's it like to be called at 11 o'clock? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes <laughs> awakening. <laughs> What can I say? But uh, but uh, you know all, all his all his friends uh, uh, really treasure those uh, those calls. Uh, another part of his scientific personality is uh, is that uh, he operates much better than most people do at a high level of ambiguity. Um, that, that's an important thing in a way that's not always realized. The uh, you know, very often the ability of uh, somebody who's really uh, innovative comes from their ability to strip away all detail and see, see the, uh, see a question, so to speak, in its, uh, in its uh, raw core form. Uh, and, uh, because that way, it, it, it simply is simpler. You know, you're not worried about all these details. And John has a uh, John has an exceptional ability and an exceptional tendency to throw details away in thinking about a question and to take the attitude that is often very frightening to his technical collaborators. Oh, that that's a mere detail which we'll fill in later. Often, when when you know the mere detail uh, strikes. The other person has a very formidable difficulty. Uh, so, so uh, you know, he's, he deals very well with the kind of world of blur. Uh, a lot of people uh, then, in dealing with them, can't see the ideas. Sometimes they wind up seeing only the blur, and, and it, it uh, strikes them, uh, the whole situation strikes them as impossibly blurry. So he needs, you know, he needs to be, impedance matched to his conversational partners uh, to a high degree. Otherwise, if they, don't, if they don't see that, it all becomes quite impossible. He did, uh, uh, I may also mention that he did some teaching for us uh, down at, at New York University. And, and uh, he, uh, he, he's the sort of person who will do very well with really talented students. Uh, you know, he, he had a key influence on Ken Kennedy of Rice University, for example, who's, who's become a, a leading figure in compiler development, and uh, particularly on the optimization side. You know, he's, Ken is, uh, for all that he has himself contributed, uh, very much a, a cock disciple, as I am. And, and uh, the uh, so, so that's an example of a great educational success, yet with the weaker students, John uh, managed to be a complete disaster, uh, owing in part to his remarkable lecture style, which, is, uh, which consists of instant erasure. He, he writes very small on the board, covers what he's writing with his body, and then as soon as he's written it, erases it so that nobody but he can see what he's writing. Okay. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, I, I was saying of John's, uh, of John's teaching style that it was very disastrous for the weaker students because um, he, uh, you know, he's not one to present detail, so uh, it was all broad strokes, and, and uh, that can be very effective to people who fill in the detail themselves, but, uh, but uh, uh, for the people who aren't getting it, uh, they're completely baffled. You know, they're, they're, all they see is three lines. It doesn't create any mental figure for them at all. 
And, uh, and as far as technique goes, he had this strange habit of uh, writing on the board, covering what he was writing with his body, and immediately erasing it so that all you saw from the back row was a blank board with somebody with John Cock looking at it and uh, apparently seeing words written on it that nobody else could see. The, um, it's, it's also, uh, you know, working with him can be frustrating because, because of his tendency to, to see, so to speak, the homomorphic image of the question very clearly and not care about the details because often if one will go to him saying, uh, I've just filled in this detail. And, from his point of view, it's it's a very ho hum kind of thing. It's uh, that's that's just a detail, you know. Of, of course, you can fill in that detail. He's had an abiding interest in mathematics. That's another uh, uh, side of him. He's uh, he's it's fascinated him. He took a, he took a doctorate in mathematics, but then always worked, I think, in computing. Um, he has a, a, a degree also in engineering, and uh, I believe in uh, mechanical engineering with a specialization in refrigeration. Though I would never, uh, I would never wish to have my home air conditioned by John. <laughs> uh, the, um, but I, that may have been what gave him the kind of technical background that he's functioned in so well. He has a very good ability to think of orders of magnitude. You know, he, he sees things in their relative weight and proportion uh, very well, and is very good at, uh, at telling the important part of a question from the unimportant part of it. The, the, uh, yeah, John, John uh, was, certainly had a great influence on me. Uh, he had in he had in his in his head and and uh, there had already been some uh, early publications uh, involving himself and Fran Allen, uh, but he had in, in his head a whole host of compiler optimization techniques that uh, were quite uh, novel and became quite influential and the uh, the. Uh, intellectual history there really is that that I learned them from him as uh, and uh, wrote them down you know for, they were written down first in a series of internal IBM technical reports connected with the uh, with the uh, ACF project that must have been oh 72 or something like that uh, then uh, those, but those never were publicly distributed. You know, some people still have them as, as old ACF workbook files and that sort of thing. Then they were, I, I wrote them down in a set of notes on compilers. Uh, the, the, these are the Koch and Schwartz uh, old notes on compilers. And I think uh, uh, from there they got into the more standard textbook literature, uh, you know, Aho, Aho and Ullman and that sort of place. The, but the, I think the first publications of them were, uh, were in that set of notes, uh, the Koch and Schwartz notes. Um, but those were all things that John simply was well aware of when I came on the scene and was talking about. Uh, but as a, as a lifelong non-writer, he uh, he never wrote them down. His career is remarkable in that sense because most scientists are absolutely dependent on uh, written publications. You know, you don't exist unless you publish. Uh, uh, the, John has had this uh, unique ability somehow to think, think up the ideas and get other people to write them down. It's that the ideas are so good that you can't stand it that they shouldn't be written down. Uh, but that's the way they've gotten uh, out. I, I believe, uh, as a matter of fact, that, that even his Turing Award lecture was written by somebody else, <laughs> you know, from his ideas, which, which is in itself unusual. The, uh, um, he, uh, you know, he, especially in the ACF days, but, but uh, really it was a lifelong uh, thing for him, he, He, uh, 
he, re he uh, related uh, very strongly to, to uh, Jack Bertram. You know, Jack is a, is a major figure in the story. Um, you know, Jack was very much the manager rather than the creator of ideas, but he had an unusual, uh, an unusual ability to discern ideas and also to locate talents. And he located John very strongly and, you know, relied very much on John to set directions in a, uh, in a big, important uh, project. And even after the project uh, broke up uh, and John came to Yorktown and Bertram became the president of various uh, IBM divisions and then uh, I guess the chief engineer uh, for the uh, corporation and then uh, head of large machines and so on and so forth, uh, John continually interacted with him as a kind of informal advisor. Uh, John admired him very much. He admired John very much. Um, he, uh, he found also other talents, and I, I vividly remember uh, just before the first time I met Andy Heller, who subsequently became an IBM fellow also, that uh, uh, Jack Bertram told me I've, I, something like, I found another John Cock, and he's only 23 years old. <laughs> So that was, uh, that was Bertram's standard for technical excellence. Oh, it's hard to, you know, it, yeah, if one knows people well, uh, it's hard to think of them in terms of any one favorite memory. Uh, the, uh, you know, he's, I remember him uh, over the course of years always batting around the halls at uh, Yorktown. Uh, he, he um, uh, is more a personality to be found in the halls than in his office. It's very difficult to telephone him because he's never, at, he's never in his office. Um, he's, uh, he can be conspicuously disorganized. The, in, uh, there's a story about him, which I believe uh, is true, that at one point he lost his tennis racket on top of his desk and couldn't find it for six months, uh, which indicates a high degree of disorganization. And one of his secretaries from the ACF days, who had been for months forbidden ever to either clean out his office or, uh, or to allow the cleaning people to do so, at one point when he was away on a trip, rushed in and started to organize his office and found something like $4,000 in stock certificates in the waste paper basket, so so that's a, that's a measure of his uh, his abilities to keep a, a neat desk. Well, I would I would characterize him uh, as I have as as a very boyish personality, more you know more so than most. There's that in everybody. I think most people somehow mature to to a kind of age of 13 and exceptionally mature people who go on to be presidents and corporation presidents may get up to 15. Uh, the, uh, the typical scientist is about 11 and John is, is uh, uh, somewhere between 9 and 10. You know, he's, he still has that boyish enthusiasm which is very irrepressible and uh, he just loves the questions that he's dealing with. It, yeah, it is contagious, and and uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's also it's. I find his ability to uh, see into the future to, and to perceive what is going to be important in technological developments and to see what the real balance of things is, still very instructive. So uh, that's. Yeah. You know, in, in that sense, if one wa if one has puzzled oneself uh, to find the just balance in a question, he's a very good one, uh, very good one to get advice from. Well, he, John is not. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Um, John, uh, the word inspiring often goes with people who have a more guruistic quality. Than John, you know, uh, John uh, and who, who, so to speak, are inspiring and know they're inspiring. John is much more 
a workaday scientist. You know, he's 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 a very real personality. You know, there's there's never anything pretentious about him. He is what you see is what you get, and and uh, so so he's inspiring, but in a quiet way. You know, you don't you don't uh, come away. Uh, you don't come away feeling that you have been given an inspiring sermon, but only that you have seen a question and it's uh, you know handled very well and, and judged very well. And so it's uh, it's inspiring in that sense, but not uh, he's not at all like Buckminster Fuller, who's a very flamboyant uh, kind of personality. Um, well, his, his ideas, uh, you know, he had, uh, he had these very unique insights into the, into the process of compilation, into the design of machines, into, uh, into speech and uh, language, and, uh, and st into statistical t techniques for their elucidation, which remain quite interesting and provocative, um, into uh, the directions of technology. In that sense, uh, IBM has been a, uh, an ideal environment for John because it's given him, it's backed him up with a machine that would translate his uh, dreams into reality, uh, pr provided that he was prepared to be patient enough. The, you know, in, in uh, some of these cases, there really have been uh, you know, several decades intervening between the dream and the reality. But nevertheless, it's always surrounded him uh, with the, uh, you know, with the big powerful team that was appropriate to him. And it also served to keep him into, keep him in vital and daily touch with where the technology was going because he could always visit the fish kill laboratories and speak to the experts there who, uh, could think uh, through the question of where memory chips, you know, in 1975, could think through the question of where memory chips might be in 1990, and allow John to plan architectures and to start thinking through designs that would make sense in that kind of setting. So uh, that's, you know, that's one of the things that being in a big corporation with a vast range of technical uh, skills available uh, gives one. John is, uh, is a prime source for, uh, for a number of key ideas in the computer field. He really is, is the key inventor of modern optimization technology. And uh, the, I don't know when he first started thinking about those things because he already knew them when I met him. So uh, they may go back to the stretch days or, uh, or even uh, earlier. That's always been his central interest on the software side, though he he's did one well-known paper of an unusual and interesting sort on, on parsing technique, the so-called cock younger early uh, parsing uh, algorithm. Uh, but uh, his most distinguished work on the software side by far is the origination of the, of the compiler optimization technology. And that then was taken up by quite a number of people. You know, it was published. It became known through Fran Allen's writings. Um, it, uh, a little school of compiler optimization was built up at NYU because I had had contact with John and uh, and uh, so I knew about that technology and I could teach it at compiler courses and other people like Ken Kennedy and Ken Kennedy's students and so forth all, uh, all uh, sort of flow out of that stream of ideas. He's also a key originator of the RISC architecture. Uh, he's always been very uh, clever in the design of machines. Again, you know, the things the things that he has recently brought to fruition are things that he already was thinking about in 1967. Uh, so uh, 
but you know, it's taken it's taken a while for the world to catch up and uh, and for the technology to make everything feasible. It might have been feasible earlier had ACF made it all the way to the product stage because uh, that, of course, that wasn't a small machine. That wasn't a desktop, but uh, it, that was simply because the components were larger. And the what has become uh, what has become the uh, 6,000 workstation is, I think, not uh, really all that far from some of the architectural ideas that were going into these much earlier machines. So uh, you know that, that's now there. I don't quite know the uh, the flow of ideas. You know the the public uh, association with risk architectures is in is to some extent with John Hennessy's group at Stanford, um, and I know that John had some kind of an influence on that, but I can't trace it exactly. There may be a thread leading through optimization because another of Hennessy's interests was compiler optimization, and he certainly knew uh, John's uh, work in that area. Uh, he might be an interesting one to speak to and get get that side of the history. Um, I, I would think of John's most important uh, contribution as being the compiler optimization technology. The, uh, the machine architecture, machine architectures will change with technology and uh, the machines uh, of uh, today are going to be superseded by Lord knows what, possibly optical computers or uh, very advanced electronic technologies of some sort. But, uh, or uh, perhaps the uh, whole Josephson area has some possibilities, though John, as a matter of fact, never was very enthusiastic about that technology. But, uh, but the compiler optimization is an abiding issue uh, because it always, uh, you always run into optimization questions whenever you're at the border between two languages of different level. And since languages will evolve into the indefinite future, one is always going to need those optimization techniques. So I predict a very long run uh, for those uh, things, and I think uh, you know, if John is still remembered in 3000, he'll be remembered as the originator of these optimization techniques still being used in quite different settings and highly transmogrified forms.